But um, so this, I put this up. I'll come back to it. But uh, this, the title of the story, which is which is the title of my new book, is the greatest story ever told so far. And um, and so I thought I'd I, I, I'd begin as a good storyteller might, in fact, a good British storyteller. So I figured it's the best of times. And, 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 and by that, I mean that the, the Large Hadron Collider is operating and has not created a black hole that would destroy the world. And, um, but it is indeed also the worst of times. Well, let's get rid of him, but uh, OK. And, um, and what is, I put this up because you know, one of the things that physics lectures do take us away from the myopic crap that we have to deal with. But also, what I want to talk about is really the greatest intellectual adventure the humans have ever taken, and, and in some sense, the greatest aspects of being a human. So it's, it's in, this is the worst aspects of being a human. And, 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 I, and, it, and it's so nice that we can periodically rise above that, um, this, that, the, the awful experiences where I'm having right now, and we are, and you will. Um, anyway, so let's go. Now back to the picture I started with, which is um, Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night, which, which is uh, one of my favorite images of his. Uh, when I look at this, uh, I, I wonder what he was thinking when he, when he painted it. Because uh, did he really see this image? Picasso was famously said that he painted what he saw and obviously lied. but. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, Van Gogh was kind of uh, unstable. And so the question is, what, is this what he saw? Or is this the hidden reality that he saw was underneath? When he looked at the sky, this is what he felt was underneath. It's that hidden reality, as, which is the title of this lecture, uh, that, that is interesting to me. Because we, we, we're hardwired to, to want to, there to be more to the universe than we can see. And science is certainly provided uh, fodder for that. The science has discovered a world that the, uh, many aspects of the world we can't see, some of which I'll talk about it. About. It's also been responsible for religion. But it's this, this notion that there really is, a, that there's a tip of a cosmic iceberg that we're somehow seeing. And, and, and the question I have is, what if, what, if, what if this is what he really saw? Okay. What if the world was an illusion? What if, what if the world we really see now is an illusion? And that's the subject I want to talk about because it really is. The world we see is an illusion. And, and a better example of that is, 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 is this image, which we'll come back to, which is a, um, icicles on a window, uh, which, which you may, again, get cold enough someday here to have, um, uh, although not if Donald Trump has anything to do with it. But um, uh, so. They're beautiful, and it's interesting to look at this pattern on a, on a, on a window. But when you do, you notice that the, uh, the crystals are in all different directions. There's nothing particularly special about them. But ask yourself, what if, what if you lived on one of these ice crystals? What if you lived on this one right here? What if you're a physicist living on this ice crystal? What, what, would, what would the world seem like to you? Well, it would be obvious, first of all, there's one direction that's very special. That direction there, and it would be, and the laws of nature would be very different in that direction than they would be perpendicular to that line. And so, the the the, the science, certainly the experience you'd have, is that it was natural, uh, ingrained, that a very central property of your existence was the fact that this direction was special. And religions would be based on that, that somehow that direction was was ordained by God and designed so that you could live in the world in which you're living. And, uh, and the point is, this is an illusion. And it's an illusion we can see because we're outside of that system. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if scientists on that crystal could somehow divine that the real world was quite different than the world they see? And that's the story I want to tell you about. The, the revolution that's really taken place over the last century in our fundamental understanding of the universe, of matter on, and energy on its smallest scales, that has revealed this illusion that we have, but also revealed that things that we hold dear, including our very existence, are an accident. That 
the illusion of design, among other things, as you'll see, is an accident. So that's where I want to go, and that's a story I want to tell, and I do think it's the greatest intellectual journey that humans have ever taken. And it saddens me that it's not more well understood, and I'm very happy to have written the, the, book, the last book about it, because um, many people think of the 20th century revolutions that have taken place, you know, Einstein and quantum mechanics, but there's actually a period much more recently where, in fact, I think in the far future, when people look back, they'll say the most revolutionary period of the 20th century was not 1905, was not in the 1920s, but actually was much later. But that isn't well known, and I want to I wanna relate it to you now. Okay. This is our universe, as seen in a rather uh, grainy image right now. But this is the large, uh, this is the deep, Hubble Deep Field image. And this, and we already know that a lot, a lot of uh, my last book, in some sense, was about the fact that this image, in some sense, on the larger scales, is sort of an illusion, that the important stuff is, uh, is not the stuff we see, but the stuff we can't see. And that really dominates the universe. And, and, and in fact, I've lectured in this hall, this very hall, about that subject. But uh, I want to go back to, to say, well, when we look at this universe, it inspires us to think about what caused all this. And I go back, and it's not just because my friend Anthony Grayling was introduced me that I want to begin with philosophy. Um, but as many of you know, I'm a great lover of philosophy. And um, uh, I begin with this, this fellow. And whenever I ask who this is, and I'm not, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do this because I don't wanna embarrass you. Everyone always says Aristotle, and it isn't. Okay, it's, 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 it's Plato. And um, for me, Plato was profoundly important because I was forced to read him when I was in, in high school. Um, I grew up in Canada where they educate you. And, um, and, 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 uh, and, they, and so I, I, I read Plato's Republic and, um, and there, there was a, a, a part of the Republic which has stayed with me ever since, the allegory of the cave. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 uh, and, and so I, w I went back to my high school book where I, where, and I found, a, I found a drawing from it, which is this. Um, so Plato argued that we are, in fact, what we see. reality is not what we see. What we see is a shadow of reality. And, his, the, and he used this example of a cave. He likened our humans to being individuals in a cave, uh, chained to a cave, to, so they could only see the, the walls of the cave, uh, and, and outside was here, and, and the light from outside came back, uh, and, and, and also there was a fire behind them, and they could see people on this roadway, but they could only see the shadows. So their world was just a shadow of reality. And, and he said, well, you know, uh, the job of the philosopher, mathematician, is to, is to discern, based on those shadows, what the real, what reality really is, the job of, uh, of modern physicists, say. And he said that, that, if you, uh, that, that you could try and do that, but if, if you were ever dragged out to the sunlight, not only would it be incredibly painful, and disturbing to see the true nature of reality. But it, if you ever did settle down and see it, if you ever came back and tried to relate to the people back uh, in the cave what you'd seen, they'd think you were crazy. And, and, uh, and, and as a physicist, I, I'm familiar with that feeling. Um, because the esoteric nature of, of particle physics is so far removed from human experience that many people just give up, but also say it just, you know, uh, What's the point, or it doesn't make sense? And so, but the other thing, image, by the way, which is interesting, it, this is dated. It dates me because this, is, this book is from the um, late 1950s. And so, in, so you notice that the people that are bound here on the wall, these scantily clad women in, in bikinis, which I think is, a, is a, although I understand actually um, Donald Trump's labor secretary uses that now in his ads as well. But, but, um, but it is historically wrong, because in Plato's time, it would have been young boys. Um, <laughs> but in any case, it, it, those individuals would have seen a reality that's different than the reality we're privileged to know about, because we live outside the cave. But, but we can imagine some of the misrepresentations about reality they may have had. And, and one of them is this. They, there'd be no idea of length. We know what length is. Things have fixed length. and we. We're familiar with that here, but in, in, in the cave, it, there would, length would have no meaning to them because they might see a, the, the, the shadow of a, a plastic ruler, say, that behind them, where the light could go through them. And at sometimes the day would look like that, and sometimes the day would look like that. And they'd say, well, clearly objects change their length randomly. 
And then, if there was a sufficiently intuitive and, and, and thoughtful philosopher, they, that person might say, you know what? Actually, we're seeing the shadows of reality. And what we're really seeing is a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional universe. And so, just as, let's see, oh yeah, okay. So, so you know, if I, my arm is this long here, but you see if I rotate my arm, it gets shorter. And if you couldn't see that, I'll just show you with this here. So if we look from above here, if I have a ruler that's parallel to the wall, the shadow of the ruler is that long, but of course if I rotate the ruler in this extra dimension, then the projection of the shadow on the wall becomes smaller. So if the philosopher, mathematician, scientist eventually was smart enough to realize this, they'd say, really there is such a concept of length. It's in, but the real world is three-dimensional and we're only seeing a two-dimensional projection. And so length has physical meaning. So that would have been interesting. And, and that gives you an example of the kind of things that you have to think about that go beyond your experience. And we'll come back to this in a bit because I want to jump ahead to this guy here. And you're a British audience, so you may know who this is. Who is it? Michael Faraday, that's right. The greatest, uh, the greatest experimentalist of the 19th century. A one, an amazing individual in many, many ways, uh, in fact, but, but not least because he achieved his eminence without any formal education. Um, he was a bookbinder's apprentice, and uh, as I, I was just telling the students at Anthony's College, they, they, uh, there's a valuable lesson to be learned from Michael Faraday if you're a student, which is to suck up to your professors. Um, he he uh, attended the lectures of Humphrey Davy, who was head of the Royal Institution, not far from here, and he uh, and he he attended those lectures and he took beautiful notes and then uh, bound them in a book, which he then presented to Humphrey Davy and said, "Can I be your assistant?" And of course, he became his assistant uh, and eventually rose to become the head of the Royal Institution. And in fact, I think he may have even established the Christmas lectures. I'm not sure, um, and um, which he gave for many years, but Faraday. Because he wasn't trained as a, uh, uh, had no formal education, wasn't comfortable with mathematics uh, in general. In fact, he said he only wrote down one equation in his life. But of course, he discovered the laws on which everything in this room is based, uh, the, ultimately the laws of electricity and magnetism that govern our lives. And he did it with a laboratory with lots of esoterica, which I also, this is a story I like to relate to politicians because um, it didn't seem very practical at the time, and there's at least an apocryphal story, or two or three, I've heard different versions of it, about someone like Gladstone coming into his laboratory and looking around and seeing these frogs jumping and all these other things happening, wheels, and, 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 and said, so what, what use is any of this? And there's two answers that Faraday is, well, two different answers I've heard that Faraday is supposed to have given. One was, of what use is a newborn baby? Okay, well, that's okay. But the better one, he said, is, what are you talking about? This is so useful that one day you will tax us for this. <laughs> and he was absolutely right, because he established the laws of the, the electric power is based on, and, and we get taxed on it now. Now, he, he had problems with math, as I say, and he therefore used crutches, mental crutches, to try and understand pictorially what was happening, say, with the simple repulsion of two electric charges. And in, in a sense, he answered a question that, I, that, that Newton himself had left aside. Newton discovered the laws of gravity, of course, but, but never answered the question, how does the Earth know where the sun is to fall towards it? And he, he said famously, hypothesis non fingo, and I frame no hypothesis, just figured out how gravity worked, but, but didn't worry about the, you know, why the Earth knew the sun was there. And, and in fact, so there's the same problem with two electric charges. How does one electric charge and all the other electric charges there. And Faraday resolved this in a, in a, in a way because with his mental crutch. He pictured an electric charge as having these lines going outside of it, and the no, number of lines would be proportional to the magnitude of the electric charge. We call, and he called that the electric field. And then he could understand what happened. He said, if I put another charge down somewhere in space, it doesn't know that charge is there. It feels the field lines coming from that charge. So if I put a, another positive charge here, it'll be repelled in the direction of the field lines. And, and it gets even better because if I put two charges together, they both have field lines and the field lines repel, so I can sort of imagine how you draw them. And the interesting thing is, these are exactly right. They reproduce the mathematics, the algebra, of the electric field perfectly. So they're an exact 
math representation. His crutch gave him all the right answers. So you know, for example, if you put a positive charge right there, it's going to zoom off in that direction. And in fact, there's twice as many field lines there as there in that. So the forces be twice as big as that one. And it all works out beautifully. So that was just a mental crutch for him, these electric fields. So hold that thought for a second. The other thing he discovered was, and the reason we really remember him, was that up to that point, it was well known that there was some relationship between electricity and magnetism. That uh, if you moved a charge and had an electric current, you'd create a magnet. That was well known. The French had shown that. And, um, uh, and so fine. And so people said, well, if a magnet can create an electric force, I mean, sorry, if an electric force can create a magnet, okay, I make a charge move along and it makes a magnet and then I, I can attract another magnet. So moving charge can create, some, create a magnetic field. Can a magnet affect a charge? It should be reciprocal in some way. And people had tried for the longest time and couldn't. And, you know, they brought very strong magnets near charges and they couldn't get anything happening. And Faraday, by accident, of course, discovered the relationship. He had, a, he had, a two, he had a two current loops, one connected to a battery and the other one not, but a current loop. And, he, and, and when he turned on, when he connected to the battery, so a current began to flow here and, and it became a magnet, suddenly a charge flowed in that other loop. What he discovered was that a, that a changing magnetic field, because as that becomes a magnet, it starts out at zero and becomes stronger, a changing magnetic field could produce an electric force in that particle. So, uh, so indeed, there was a reciprocal relationship. Uh, in some sense, a, a moving charge could produce a magnetic field, and a changing magnetic field could produce a force on a charge. And ultimately, that created an important step, which, in fact, the next person I want to show you finished. This is the most famous theoretical physicist of the 19th century and the, and the greatest. And who's this? Maxwell. I love the fact that we're a literate audience. It's great. Okay, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who was an amazing guy, Scott. And um, there's an interesting history. He died very young, but he still did, did he's younger than many of the people in this room, but he did an incredible amount in that time. And um, um, he, he was a mathematician as well. He was mathematically literate. And so what he did was he realized that in order to make the discoveries that Faraday had made, to, to make it all consistent, you had to fix things up. And he made what we now call Maxwell's equations, the four Maxwell's equations that undergraduate physics students have on their chest and, you know, with the four equations and let there be light. Because, um, because not God, but Maxwell demonstrated how, how there was, would be light. Because what Maxwell discovered, and it is the, indeed, in my opinion, the most exciting calculation you can do as an undergraduate physicist, uh, I think, uh, is he realized the following. If I take a charge and shake it, okay, then what's happening? Well, I'm, I'm having a current that's, that, that's, that's um, first I have a current, so I produce a magnetic field here, but the current is changing. So the magnetic field I'm producing here is changing. But if I have a changing magnetic field, this changing magnetic field is going to produce an electric field here which is changing. But that changing electric field here is going to produce a magnetic field there is changing, which is going to produce electric field here is changing all the way. And you're going to get a disturbance that travels out. And the amazing thing is, by measuring the strength of the force between two electric charges in the laboratory, and then by measuring the force between two magnets in the laboratory, measuring those two fundamental constants of nature, he could calculate what the speed of that disturbance would be. And lo and behold, when you do that calculation, you discover it's the speed of light that was measured to the speed of light. Thereby answering the question, what was light, which had been around since before Newton, and discovering that light was a wave of electric and magnetic fields. And that was amazing, because electric and magnetic fields were an intellectual crutch that Faraday had developed in his mind because he didn't, couldn't do the math. But they weren't just an invention of the human imagination. They were as real as, as the hand in front of your face because you wouldn't see the hand in front of your face. It's the electric fields. It's light itself. So this, this imaginary thing that, that Faraday had developed turned out to be essential. But it also meant that they completed this, the most amazing unification, the first amazing unification in physics, Two things which seemed very different, an electric field and a magnetic field, 
were seen to be really different aspects of exactly the same thing. One person's electric field would be another person's magnetic field. It just depended upon what you were doing. If you're standing next to an electric charge and you're a charge, you feel an electric force. But if you're running compared to that electric charge, that charge is moving with respect to you and you feel a magnetic force. So really, they were different facets of the same thing. And that is the hallmark of progress in science when disparate parts of our universe are seen to be reflections of the same thing. Just like for Plato's people, that, the, the, that in fact different length objects were really seen to be different reflections of the same thing. That's the hallmark of progress, and that's what you generally look for in, and, and understand as being real development. So that, that beautiful development of Maxwell's completed the great unification, the, uh, uh, the first great unification of physics. That was in the 19th century. And then we now move to the 20th century. Oh, I just have a picture of the electromagnetic field, but let's skip that because it's, there it is. But we will skip it eventually when this thing starts. There we go. This guy, well, you all know who that is. I don't have to ask. Okay. You've all heard of him. Um, and, 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 but it's interesting. Um, he is a, a, a paradigm for people. And, he's, he's, and, and, and he affects many of us in many ways. In my case, every day I get about five emails uh, from people uh, who tell me the following. Um, everyone says I'm crazy they say. But everyone said Einstein was crazy. Therefore, <laughs> and then they say, and this is the real, this is the real kicker, because this is when I know to press delete. Um, they say, everything you think you know is wrong. All of modern physics is wrong. And just like Einstein, I can show you that it's all wrong, because that's what Einstein did. He showed it's all wrong. But, but they demonstrate is a profound misunderstanding of science. Scientific revolutions do not do away with what went before them. In fact, what survives the test of experiment will always survive the test of experiment. It will always be in some sense true. Newton's laws, simple laws of motion, have been supplanted at scales, small scales by quantum mechanics and large scales by general relativity, but they're absolutely true for the motion of baseballs and cannonballs and uh, cricket balls, to the extent that anyone cares about that. Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and so, what Einstein actually, the brilliance of Einstein was quite the opposite. What Einstein realized is that there were two aspects of reality that had survived the test of experiment that were inconsistent with each other. But he, and he said, well, what was he going to do? He, he didn't throw them out. What he did was find a way to make them consistent. So, so what are they? Well, one, we've already, I've already given you, I've already prepared your minds. That's Maxwell. Maxwell said, if I shake a charge, an electromagnetic wave will go out, and the speed of that wave will be determined by measuring the strength of electricity, the strength of the force of two electric charges in the laboratory, and the strength of magnetism. Okay? So that's there. Now, the other one that was tested by hundreds of years of observation was Galileo. Galileo's great discovery was that, that Aristotle was wrong yet again. Anthony, I've had this, I have had this debate because I, 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 I'm profoundly influenced by the fact that it seems to me Aristotle was almost never right. Well, when he talked about the physical world. But he, Aristotle did what, you know, what human experience tells us, with common sense, which is that all objects like to go to rest. You move them and they stop. So being at rest is, is of special significance. But what Galileo realized is that's just an accident of our circumstances. Because, you know, he gave these examples of if I done, if you have a ball or you, you slide on ice, you, can, you don't go to rest very much. If I have a ball on a very smooth platform, it'll go for a long way. So things don't naturally go to rest. You can imagine, in fact, that if you get rid of this extraneous thing called friction, that the objects will go on forever. And what he said, which laid the basis for Newton, is if that the natural state of motion is, is to not change its state of motion. Being at rest, you stay at rest. But there's nothing different from being at rest than moving at a constant speed. In fact, the way we frame what he said now is that there's no experiment you can do that will tell you if you're moving at a constant speed or at rest. 
you all had the experience of being on a, a subway train here in, in, in London and, and in, in, in the station, and for a moment the train on the other side is, starts moving, and you don't know if you're moving or they're moving. And, and that, the answer is you can't do any experiment until you start shaking and you're not moving in a, a constant speed. Or when you're in an airplane, if the windows are closed and you throw a baseball up or a coin, it comes back down. There's no way you can prove you're moving. Okay, it's just like if you're standing still, like you're doing here, right? Wrong. Okay, we're moving around the sun at 30 kilometers per second right now. 30 kilometers per second. We're moving, the sun's moving around the galaxy at 200 kilometers per second. But we keep saying we're at rest. That's because it feels like we're at rest. That's because we, there's no way to tell the difference if we're moving at a constant speed. Okay, those are the two things. Can't, there's no experiment that'll tell you whether you're moving or standing still. That's Galileo. Maxwell, shake a charge, moves out of the speed of light, determined by those two fundamental constants of nature. Now, the average person might not see those as being problematic, but Einstein realized they were completely inconsistent. And, 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 and I can explain this to you, the example that I'm going to present, I first thought of when my daughter was very young. So I will use um, projectile vomit as the... As the, as the, as the so we... we Let's say I, was, I used to drive her in the car when she was young to nursery school, and, and she didn't like the car very much. And, um, and so let's say we're driving along at some slow speed in traffic, say 20 miles an hour. And, um, and, and so someone watches me. I'm, I'm traveling 20 miles an hour, and someone on the ground sees the car go by 20 miles an hour. And she's in the back seat, and she projectile vomits and hits the back of my head from the back seat to the front seat. And, and it goes at 10 miles an hour in the car. So the vomit hits me at 10 miles an hour. But of course, someone on the ground watching that, laughing, um, uh, sees the car moving at 20 miles an hour and the vomit at 10 miles an hour in the car. Therefore, the vomit is moving with respect to them at 30 miles an hour. What a great audience. Okay, great. Good. No problem. But now let's say my daughter is a 20th, first century kid, and, and, and she has, she's a little laser that she plays with. And so she shoots a laser beam at the back of my head. Okay, laser beam travels at the speed of light. What's, what does this person on the ground see when laser beam? Well, the car is moving along at 20 miles an hour. The laser is in the car, and the laser is in the car moving at the speed of light. So the person on the ground sees the light ray as traveling at the speed of light plus 20 miles per hour. That makes sense. Okay, the problem is that's inconsistent with Maxwell in a way because Maxwell says when I shake an electric charge like I do in this laser, a light ray goes out and it travels at the speed of light and that's determined by the fundamental strength of electricity and the fundamental strength of magnetism. But that's inconsistent with Galileo because if the person on the ground sees the light ray as being the speed of light plus 20 miles per hour, that must mean in their laboratory the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism is different. Because Maxwell tells me that the light ray, is the speed of the light ray is determined by the strength of electricity and the strength of magnetism. Therefore, if this person on the ground sees it at a different speed than the person in the car, that person on the ground must make a different measurement in their laboratory for the strength of two fundamental forces. But Galileo says that's not possible because there's no experiment you can do that will tell you the difference of whether you're moving or standing still. So you can't, they both can't be right. It doesn't work. And the brilliance of Einstein was to realize, well, they're both right, because they both, for hundreds of years of Galileo and less than 50 years for Maxwell, those things survived the test of experiment. They can't be wrong. I can't throw them out. So what he figured was a very creative way to make Galileo and Maxwell consistent. And that way was to say, well, what is speed? Speed is distance traveled in some time. So if two different observers moving with respect to another, are going to measure light to have exactly the same speed with respect to each of them, which is crazy, that can only be possible if measurements of distance and measurements of time are different for each of them. If the measurement of distance and your measurement of time is relative, depending upon your relative state of motion. And that was the brilliance of Einstein, that realized that that would bring the two together. And then, of course, there were implications of that, which, which and, and there are three of them that I can talk about here. One of them is that, indeed, if I'm moving in a car with respect to you with this pointer, the length of the pointer, which may be eight centimeters or something like that, for me, 
For you, that object will be, if I'm moving fast enough, say four centimeters. And people think this is sort of some illusion. You think it's four centimeters, but it's really eight centimeters. But it isn't really eight centimeters. For me, it's really eight centimeters. But for you, it is really four centimeters. It is both. Because there's no experiment you can perform that'll tell you it isn't four centimeters. And therefore, if you think about it, and this is really important for Einstein, what we think of as reality is, is operational. It's what we measure. And if every measurement we make is consistent with something, that's what it is. There's no independent meaning of length except what we measure. So, it's four centimeters for you, it's eight centimeters for me, it's even worse because your ruler which you hold up will be eight centimeters for you and it'll be four centimeters for me. It's reciprocal, but it's true. And it, both people are true, are, are correct. The other thing is that simultaneity changes that two events that happen at the same time for me in different locations will happen at different times for you, which is one event will happen before the other for you even though they happen at the same time for me. And again, we're both right. And that may cause problems for some of you with cause and effect, but I'm not going to deal with here. You can ask for that in the question period. It turns out it's no problem. The last one is the one that science fiction uh, writers use so much, and that is that my clock ticks more slowly than you, yours if I'm moving with respect to you. And, and we measure it every day in undergraduate physics laboratories. That my, it really is true. Clocks slow down. It, it, it's not some bit of science fiction. It's really true. Now, these three implications actually laid the basis for the second great unification, which wasn't really due to Einstein, but due to his math professor. Okay? And I prepared your minds for it. If you look here, this looks very similar. In fact, it's exactly the same as the picture I showed you in, in Plato's cave. Einstein's math professor, Hermann Minkowski, one of the few people who um, Einstein admired, although he didn't go to his classes, um, uh, in three years after special relativity was developed, said henceforth space by time, by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. What do you mean by that? Well, he realized that what Einstein had done in fact was not a theory of relativity but a theory of absolutes. That what Einstein had done was unify space and time in a way that Einstein didn't even appreciate. And the, 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 the reason for this is that light travels so fast that we think things happen instantaneously that don't. I take a picture of, the, of this room, if I could just see that that damn light wasn't in my eye. Um, and I take a picture of, of this room. I took a picture now, right? No, it's not now, it's then because for the people in the back of the room, because the light took some time to get to me. So the people in the back of the room, that I, the p image of the people in the back of the room is, is a, a billionth of a second before the image of the people in the front of the room. So I'm taking an image that's spread out in space and time. It's spread out in space, but it's also spread out in time. So we all are looking at three-dimensional slices of space and time. And what Hermann Mikowski realizes that the mathematics of Einstein, that Einstein's relativity developed, in fact, tell us that when I'm running with respect to you, I'm kind of like seeing a different slice, a rotated slice in a four-dimensional space of three dimensions of space and time. And so the effect in that four-dimensional space is the reason lengths look different, remember when I rotate my ruler, the length gets smaller in the projected direction, this direction. But if this is the time direction, then well, if it kind of rotates, then in one person's frame, the time at either end of the ruler is the same, but the other end, for the other frame, the time at one end of the ruler is different than the time at the beginning of the ruler, which is what happens. So what, it's a kind of, the mathematics is a little more complicated than a rotation, but effectively what Mikowski realized is that we live in a four-dimensional space-time, and what we see at any instant, depending upon our relative state of motion, is a different three-dimensional slice. We're just like the people in Plato's cave who saw a two-dimensional space and didn't realize it was part of a three-dimensional world. But we live in a four-dimensional space, and, that was, and we now call it Minkowski space in honor of from Minkowski. The second great unification caused simply by the unification of electricity and magnetism. Space and time became unified. Okay. 
Next, we jump ahead. Who's this? Feynman, of course. Well, yeah, it's on my book over there, so if you bought it, you see the picture. Um, it just occurred to me. Um, okay, what Feynman realized, and actually before him, Paul Dirac, but, but Feynman sort of explained it in a way that people could, and Dirac couldn't talk to people, but um, uh, is that when you unify, the, the next great development, of course, was quantum mechanics, it happened after relativity, and quantum mechanics says that at, at very small scales, strange things happen, very strange things. The world becomes really quite unintelligible in, 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 in terms of common sense. Electrons can be doing many things at the same time, and perhaps the most important aspect of this was that the, what became called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is that in, there are certain quantities that I can never measure exactly in nature, certain combination of qualities, quantities. It's not a property of my measuring device, but rather a property of nature. I can know, if I have a little small particle, I, have, I can know where it is at any given time with it's precisely as I can measure it, but then there's an uncertainty in knowing which direction and how fast it's going. Or I can know which direction and how fast it's going precisely, but then I won't know exactly where it is. The net effect of Heisenberg uncertainty principle is, as I'd like to say, that the laws of physics on small scales are the same as corporate America or, or in Washington, and actually in this administration they're exactly the same, but um, in the upcoming one. Because it, basically the law is, if you can't see it, doesn't matter. <laughs> Anything goes, okay? And so that means that things can happen on microscopic scales that violate what you would measure, or otherwise called the laws of physics, but as long as you can't measure them, it's okay. In quantum mechanics, they're happening all the time. And that means that, and it was Feynman who first realized that this implied something interesting. It really implies that empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence all the time. I mean, particles can't pop in and out of existence in, 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 the, in a classical world because they violate energy. You create mass where there wasn't any mass. But you see, as long as they disappear very quickly, Heisenberg says it's fine. And that's happening. And in fact, this is actually a, 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 an actual calculation of the space inside of a proton. Um, it w this was shown at the Nobel Prize ceremonies. I was there, actually, and it was uh, the, by the people who allowed that calculation to be performed. And most of the pro properties of the proton are determined not by the fact, as we teach high school kids, that there are three quarks in a proton. That's irrelevant. Most of the mass of the proton comes from these virtual particles. So you can't see them directly, but they have an incredible impact. But this also allowed Feynman to reframe the beautiful laws of electromagnetism that Maxwell had developed and to think of the electric force as being slightly different. That when two electrons repel each other, what's really happening is one electron is emitting a virtual particle, the quanta of the electromagnetic field, we call a photon, which comes in particles. And it's virtual. It takes away a little energy, potentially, and therefore it can't exist for a long time or violate laws of physics, but it turns out the amount by which you can violate energy is proportional to the time it's inversely proportional to the time in which you measure it. So if, the if it doesn't exist very long, then there can be some small violation of energy. In any case, it gets absorbed by another electron before you could ever measure it, and that causes that electron to be repelled. So the electric force is thought of as the exchange of particles. And we now think in the modern world, all forces, because of quantum mechanics, are due to the exchange of particles. Now this theory, based on the exchange of virtual particles, is the best theory in nature. Quantum electrodynamics, as it has become called, and Feynman and others won the Nobel Prize for it, can predict observations that can be compared with those observations and get agreement to 14 decimal places. There's nowhere else in, anywhere else in science where based on fundamental principles you can make a prediction and compare with observation to 14 decimal places. So this is really, I mean, and only works because these virtual particles. Okay, great, that works great. Now, this is the quantum understanding of the electromagnetic field, and Einstein got hung up for a long time in his life trying to unify gravity and electromagnetism, and that's because he got out of touch with physics. He also didn't buy quantum mechanics, so he's really out of touch with physics, and that's why he didn't make any progress 
uh, for that later part of his life. And the real reason he got out of touch with physics is that it turns out that this, that electricity and magnetism are not, and, and gravity are not the only forces in nature. So why bother just trying to unify them? Because we discovered there's another force in nature. And that force is, produces something that's amazing. When I was in high school, I first learned, to, and it amazed me, and maybe, it, I hope it'll amaze some of you if you don't know this, that the neutron is radioactive. This should surprise you because you're made up of neutrons. Most of the particles in your body are neutrons, more than protons. Now, a neutron, if I put it here in space, will decay in 10 minutes, the radioactivity. You will notice, some of you somewhat painfully, that you've been in this lecture longer than 10 minutes, and you're still around. So what gives? It's a remarkable accident. So let, let, let's, uh, the, the person who first described this decay, theoretically, was, was another one of my heroes, Enrico Fermi, who was the last great particle physicist, basically, or nuclear physicist, who was equally adept at, at theory and experiment. And he, he, he developed a theory of the describing this decay of a neutron, and then also did experiments. He won the Nobel Prize for his experiments. Um, and um, he also, of course, worked on the Manhattan Project um, and, uh, and created the first nuclear reactor underneath the football field in Chicago. And as I like to say, um, they did it under the football field at the University of Chicago because if anything happened, you'd just kill football players, there'd be no loss. Um, so, uh, but the neutron decays into a bunch of particles. It decays into a proton, and, and, and although this time it's called a beta particle, it's really an electron, a proton, electron, and another neat particle, my favorite particle in nature, called a neutrino. Okay, that's, that's the decay of a neutron. It decays in 10 minutes. Why doesn't it decay in your body? Well, it turns out the mass of the neutron is just slightly greater than the sum of the mass of a proton and electron. And a neutrino is almost massless, okay? So, if it were, it can only decay into a proton electron because it's more massive. If it was less massive, it couldn't decay because it would violate energy for a less mas massive object to decay into two more massive objects. But what happens when I put a neutron in a nucleus, like helium or oxygen or nitrogen or carbon? It gets bound in the nucleus. What does it mean to be bound in the nucleus? Well, to be bound, it means it takes energy to get it out. It loses energy when it falls into the nucleus. But Einstein told us that E equals mc squared. Therefore, when it loses energy and falls in the nucleus, it gets lighter. And when it falls in the nucleus, it's too light to decay into a proton and an electron. So you're only around because happily nuclear nuclei formed in the, in the, in the, universe, in the early universe and, and in stars in, in, that made up atoms in your body. And so it's an amazing fact that, that it's just the fact that this, the difference in mass between a neutron and a proton and electron is less than 0.1% less than of the mass of the neutron. And, and therefore, when you drop it into a nucleus, it's stable. But, I, I, I mean, that really has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about later, but I thought it's a neat little fact that you should know. Um, but this, the fact that a neutron decays means something happens. There's a new force in nature. The fact that it takes so long to decay meant this force was called the weak force. Because the standard time over which things happen in atoms, for example, light is emitted and electrons jump around, is more like a millionth of a billionth of a second. But a neutron took 10 minutes to decay. So whatever force is responsible for that decay is very, very weak. And, of course, it only happens over the size of a nucleus. You never see this force on large scales, but in a nucleus, you see these beta particles, electrons spitting out, and that was what was called beta decay. So it happens, some strange new force ex exists inside the nucleus that's very weak. So why the hell should we care about it? And the answer is we should care about it because it's responsible for our existence. It's that, it's that very force that powers the processes inside the sun that produce nuclear fusion, that produces the energy that makes, allows all of us to, to uh, be alive. And so this weak force is very important to try and understand. And people tried to understand it. And as I often say to people, physics is just like Hollywood. If it works, repeat it. Just keep doing the same thing. <laughs> you know, see, you know, Halloween 16 or whatever. Anyway, and, and so people, physicists said, okay, well, you know, we're pretty good at this repeating stuff. We know how electromagnetism works. So let's imagine this new force looks exactly the same way. This is called a Feynman diagram, by the way, after Mr. Feynman. And let's imagine that the decay of a neutron, which happens to be made of quarks, but it doesn't really matter, 
happens, it eventually produces these particles, an electron neutrino, and that happens because of the exchange of a particle, because that's what happens in forces in nature. But there's a difference. The electric force, the electromagnetic force, is long range. This happens over, only over the size of a nucleus. How can we understand that? Quite simple. Sort of quite simple. The photon is massless. That's a vital aspect of electromagnetism. The photon has no mass. This allows electromagnetism to be long range. Why? Because I remember when I told you that this thing can only exist for a little while because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. That's true, except because the photon is massless, it can carry arbitrarily small amount of energy. And that means an electron here can emit a virtual photon that travels all the way to Alpha Centauri and repels and is absorbed by an electron in Alpha Centauri producing a very small electric repulsion. The electric force is long range, it's infinite range. It goes down as 1 over r squared, but it's infinite range. That's only because the photon, the virtual photon, can exist for a very long time because it can carry a very small amount of energy. But now you see, if I make the particle that conveys the, this weak force massive, then it has to be absorbed very quickly because it's got a finite mass. It always carries non-zero energy away and therefore it has to be absorbed very quickly by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle or it will violate energy conservation. So all I have to do is to make a theory that looks exactly like this theory but make this particle massive and everything works. Except it doesn't. Because the problem is the mathematics, the beautiful mathematics that makes this for this photon massless, the symmetries of, the, of electromagnetism, the beautiful Maxwell's equations, tell you in quantum mechanics that you can do wonderful calculations. When you make the particle massive and you do the same quantum mechanical calculations, you come up with infinity. And physicists don't like infinity because it's crazy. So I just want to have a slight digression because mathematicians love infinity. And, 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 and I know Bertrand Russell gave a lecture here, and I'm feeling his, I'm channeling him. So, so I, I, I want to at least give a chance for the mathematicians. So I want to talk about another. David Hilbert did not give, as far as I know, a, a, a Conway lecture. But he, he, was the sort of, he was really the greatest mathematician of the, of the turn of the century, the last century. And he, he gave an example to show you how crazy infinity is. And I want to just give it to you to show you what part of the reason physicists don't like infinity, because you can do anything with infinity. The example he gave was we call Hilbert's Hotel. Actually, he called it Hilbert's Hotel. And it was quite simple. Imagine an infinitely big hotel. Say you go to Las Vegas. And, and you have an infinitely big hotel that holds an infinite number of people. And I can represent this hotel simply as a number line here. And I number the rooms, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way to infinity. Okay. Now, I, I go into the hotel and I say, can I check in? And he says, well, all the rooms are full. So you say, okay, I'll leave. And he goes, no, no, I can accommodate you. And you say, how? And he says, well, it's quite simple. I put, move the person from room number one into room number two, the person from room number two into room number three, and so on and so on and so on. And now, room number one's empty. No problem. Okay, well, that may not bother you so much. But let's say you have an infinitely big family, a Catholic family, and you bring them, and you bring them into the into the thing, and you say, "I want I want me and my infinite number of children to come in." And he says, "Well, the room's full. The hotel's full." You go, "Okay, sorry." And he goes, "No, no, I can accommodate you." How? So I move the person from room number one into room number two, the person from room number two into room number four, the person from room number three into room number six, and then only the even numbers are occupied, and there are an infinite number of odd numbers, so it's fine. So you see, when you try and add and subtract with infinities, you get crazy things. And even crazier things, which I won't show you, which, uh, as I was actually telling students the other day, were responsible for string theory. But, but the point is that mathematics, if you have infinities in physical calculations, you get results that are crazy. So you had to get rid of them. And, and clearly, the standard theory that made this, which should have worked, doesn't work. So how can, you, how can you resolve the fact that the weak force is short range and the electric force is long range and there seem to be no mathematical way to understand that? And the answer is the following. Maybe the universe we experience is really an illusion. Maybe mass is an illusion in some real deep way. And to understand that, 
I want to, I, I talked to you about living on an icicle, but imagine living in a superconductor. What's a superconductor? Well, here's an icicle, so let's cool things down. And if you, and, 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 and Kemmerling Onnes in 1911 discovered if he cooled mercury down to four degrees or less above absolute zero, something very strange happened. This was measuring resistance. And suddenly, to his surprise, at a specific temperature, the resistance, you know, resistance goes down as things get colder because the atoms jiggle less. But suddenly, at a certain temperature, the resistance went to zero. It didn't become very small. It went to zero. Meaning if he hooked up a battery to the, and get a current going and then cooled the whole thing down and then removed the battery below the superconducting temperature, the current would flow forever. Never lost. It would flow forever. And he called it superconductivity, which so is very good in public relations as well. But he, and of course, it's the basis of, of many things, including our Large Hadron Collider couldn't operate without it, and we'll get there in a second. But this weird aspect of the total, of the total electric resistance going to zero, we, it took 50 years for this to be understood, more than 50 years almost, and it's a weird property of quantum mechanics. The property is that somehow, it turns out in, in certain materials, electrons which normally repel, in certain materials, because of the property of materials, they actually attract. And they bind together and they collapse into a single quantum mechanical state. Now we would call a Bose-Einstein condensate, but it doesn't, the name doesn't matter. And that single quantum state behaves very weirdly. There's no resistance. But that allows interesting phenomena to happen. And an undergraduate physics experiment you can do, because now we have superconductors that become superconducting at dry ice levels. And you can do this in lab, and, and people do it in universities all the time. If you put a magnet above a superconductor, the magnet will float. Why is that? Well, it turns out magnetic fields can't permeate a superconductor. And so the magnetic field lines get repelled by the superconductor, essentially, and that holds up the magnet. Why can't they make, go into super, uh, a superconductor? Well, if you think about it, if you try and move the magnet close to a superconductor, then there's a changing magnetic field and little currents will flow in the superconductor, but they don't ever go away. So they, they cancel that magnetic field. They repel that magnetic field. Okay. Now, what does it mean that the magnetic field can't go into the superconductor? If you lived in the superconductor, what would it look like to you? It would look like electromagnetism is a short-range force because the magnetic field can only permeate a little bit into the superconductor and then it dies off. We call it a penetration depth. So if you lived in a superconductor and you grew up in a superconductor and you were a physicist in a superconductor, for you, the photon would be massive because electromagnetism is short range. So your laws of physics would be electromagnetism is short range. Now, this should prepare your minds for this now. Because maybe we're living in a superconductor, a weird kind of superconductor. And maybe what we think of as mass is just an accident of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so this is where Mr. Higgs comes in. If you're swimming in, in water, then you can swim fairly fast. If I put you swimming in molasses, you swim much slower. You feel heavier. It's like the photon in the superconductor. So maybe, what if, what if there's a background field everywhere in nature, like that Bose-Einstein condensate in the superconductor, but a slightly different kind, one invisible that permeates all of empty space. And some particles interact with that field. And as they do, like swimming in molasses, they experience a resistance because of their interaction with that field, and they behave as if they're massive. What if that's the case? What if the particles that convey the weak force interact with that background field, but the photon doesn't, so it continues to move at the speed of light, and it's massless? Well, if that's the case, you could picture, you could draw exactly the same, exactly the same Feynman diagrams for the weak interaction as the, as the photon interaction, and it's because at the fundamental scale, in reality, these particles that convey the weak force are really massless. If they interact with this background field, which happens to accidentally exist here, they look to us like they're massive, and therefore the force they mediate is short range, but at a fundamental scale, they're massless. And if at a fundamental scale, they're massless, the mathematics is identical to that of electromagnetism. 
And if the mathematics is identical to electromagnetism, the infinities go away. And more importantly, I can actually do calculations and I can compare them with observations to get exactly the right answer. And more importantly, I can then understand, in fact, that I can unify these and, in fact, they're all different aspects of the same force. Electricity and magnetism and the weak force are really fundamentally the same. They just appear differently to us because we have this accident that we're, there's a background field that somehow distinguishes between the W and Zs, as they're called, the particles that mediate the weak force, and the photon. It's an accident of our circumstances, but in fundamental reality, it's not that way at all. And if there wasn't that accidental field that somehow came into existence in our superconductor, the world would be very different. In fact, it would be so different we wouldn't be here. Because if these didn't have mass, it turns out we can say the same thing for all particles in nature, the particles that have mass. Electrons, protons, quarks, they're also interacting with this field, and the ones that behave as if they're heavier just are interacting more strongly. The ones that are lighter are interacting less strongly. So if that field wasn't there, all the particles that make us up wouldn't, be, wouldn't have mass. If there was no mass, there'd be no people, there'd be no planets, there'd be no galaxies, there'd be no anything. Our very existence comes from that accident. Well, that's an amazing hypothesis, and in fact, it was put in firmer form by a bunch of people who went on to win the Nobel Prize for their work putting the mathematics down dramatically. And then it turned out the very same ideas of symmetry that led to the weak electromagnetic interaction were then applied to the strong interaction. And these guys won the, the, the Nobel Prize for the strong interaction. And it, this is amazing because this all happened in the 1960s and 70s. In 1960, we understood one force in nature, electromagnetism as a quantum force. By 1975, we understood completely in agreement with every experiment that we could perform and exactly three of the four forces in nature. It was the biggest revolution in our understanding of the universe and no one's ever heard of it. But suddenly, we had done the next great unification of physics. First, electricity and magnetism, then space and time, and then unification of two of the three forces in nature. And of course, it didn't take a rocket scientist to think that maybe all the forces in nature are unified. And physicists began to think about something called grand unification, and they became more obnoxious than they were before because they thought they could explain everything. And, um, and, and of course, these ideas have been interesting, but they take us to a realm of the universe that we haven't been able to explore experimentally yet. So the three forces, one type of symmetry for all of them, every observation explained, hubris in the extreme, we're going to do everything, and we haven't yet. But the point is, we have gone to such a great leap because suddenly, in 15 years, our picture of reality changed completely. The universe we see is an illusion. Except all of this so far is just a story. It's not science yet. It's like religion. Because, after all, what have we posited? We've posited an invisible field everywhere that exists throughout the universe that we can't see that is responsible for our existence. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> if, it isn't, if it isn't the Bible, it's Star Wars. Okay? So that's not good enough. That's just a story. And what's really nice, is it's a, and what makes it physics, is if it's going to be physics, we have to test it. We have to be able to probe and see if that story is right. And we have to be willing to be completely wrong. And I have to say, I was sure the picture was completely wrong. Because this invisible field just seemed too slimy to me. I, I was convinced that the nature would have a better way of doing this. But there's a way to try and see if it's right. Spank the vacuum. Sadomasochism. Let's go. Spank it hard. You have to. Because in modern physics, if there's a field, there's always a particle associated with that field. And so therefore, if you dump enough energy into a single point in empty space and slam empty space with that energy, you should kick out real particles if there's a field there. If there's a Higgs field, you should kick out real particles that we call Higgs particles. So, very simply, you just, where, how can you spank the vacuum? You build a big machine. You build the Large Hadron Collider. The, the most complicated machine humans have ever built. 
26 kilometers around. If you, go to the, if you go to the airport in Geneva and fly in, you'll just see farmland, but underneath that farmland is this uh, 26 kilometer long ring, about 100 meters underground in most places, under the Jura Mountains here. This is the French Swiss border, and, and um, the, the, we accelerate protons at 99.999995% the speed of light in that direction. We accelerate another beam of photons at 99.999995% the speed of light in that direction. They go around thousands of times a second between France and Switzerland without passports, and they just zoom around. And, they, and, and every now and then, we, it, we focus that energy into single points in a few places, and we build the detectors that can look for those events. And of course, this is, a, this is one such event that was predicted. And on July 4th, 2012, we celebrated. Some of us didn't celebrate. I was really disappointed <laughs> because nature wasn't as ingenious as I figured because it was just so simple. Okay? We discovered 50-ish events that looked like a Higgs. They kind of walked like a Higgs and quacked like a Higgs. So it turns out since then we've discovered much more. They are Higgs. Every aspect of this particle discovered is exactly the same as we predicted. It is amazing. And that tells us that there really is this invisible field throughout all of nature that's responsible for our existence. This accident, as the universe cooled down, this field froze just like an icicle on a window. And before I get to the implications of that, which are profound and miserable at the same time, I want to point out that I really think that this story is humanity at its best, at its very best. Over centuries, theorists were using the ideas they could do and the most beautiful ideas you could come up with and building this picture, this incredible house of cards. And the great thing about it is it could have all fallen apart. It wasn't just that it was an elegant and interesting story, but it could have been wrong. And it wasn't. But then the experimentalists built these machines, and I would say that they are like the Gothic cathedrals of the 21st century. The Gothic cathedrals took over a century to build by thousands of artisans from many countries speaking many languages there to sort of celebrate the glory of God. The Large Hadron Collider was built by 10,000 physicists and operated by 10,000 physicists from over 100 countries. It took over 20 years to build, speaking dozens of languages, different religions, building machines that are the most complicated machines. This is one of the machines where the particles collide, and this is, this is another one. This is a small one, the compact muon solenoid. I have a better picture of it because I'm in it. Yeah, there we go. Um, and this machine has, by the way, this detector, single detector, has more iron than is in the Eiffel Tower. And has comes in two parts. Right here, there, you can go down because it wasn't operating. There's another one here about 10 meters away, the other half of it. The magnetic field is so strong in these detectors that even though they're not on wheels, if the magnetic field was turned on, those 10,000 ton pieces of iron would slam together. Incredibly intense magnetic fields produced by over five tons of liquid helium, which cools superconducting magnets, thousands of them located among that tunnel, and the tunnel itself has to have a vacuum that's smaller than the vacuum of space, less fewer particles than if you go to the International Space Station, outside of the International Space Station. And it all has to fit together with micron accuracy and incredible difficulty of measuring each second at the Large Hadron Collider, enough data is generated to fill more than 1,000 one terabyte hard drives every second. That's more than the information in all the world's libraries. And somehow we had to figure out computers, ways to use computers that could sift that information to look at this signal. It is truly the most amazing effort that humans have ever made experimentally. And it was just like the Gothic cathedrals, which pushed the technology of their time. Why? Just to discover this damn particle. And maybe a little bit more. And for some people, that just seems a waste of time and effort. But it isn't. Because ultimately, we're addressing the very questions that, that have, humans have thought about and wondered about since we've come. The questions of philosophy as well as the questions of science. Why are we here? How do we get here? What's the world made of? And the amazing thing is that we've, in that sense, and that's why the subtitle of my new book is, Why Are We Here? And the answer is, there is no reason. Namely, it's an accident. It's just an accident. Now, 
we aren't done. I don't want to suggest we're done. We'll get to the accent in a second. This is, I also like art. This is, a, I particularly like the Impressionist period. And what I love about Impressionist paintings is that from a distance they're great, but when you get up close they really suck. And, and, <laughs> and, and the same is, is, is true of the, of the universe. So this picture is beautiful, but it's nowhere near complete. Why is the Higgs field there? Why did, it, why did it exist in space? Why did it exist with the energy it has or not? Why did it give the particles the mass they have? We don't have the answers to any of those questions. And the only way to figure it out, the only way to address those fundamental questions, ultimately, is to continue to look. And we think by operating the Large Hadron Collider, among other things, we may discover the reasons. We may never discover the reasons if we don't build another collider, if they don't see anything. And part, you know, you can't go up to the government. I mean, in this case, you can't go over government and say anything sensible. But, but you can't, can you imagine going up and say, guess what, we operated the Hard Hadron Collider, and we didn't find anything. Let us build a new one. <laughs> okay, it's a problem. But the point that I want to get to to close is our existence is a cosmic accident. The illusion of design, which has been so prevalent in, in, in confusing people about nature in so many ways, happens at our level. The universe wasn't designed so we could exist. In fact, the, the prop, fundamental properties of the universe are such that we shouldn't exist. It was an accident that somehow as the universe cooled down, this Higgs field formed in just the right way so that light was massless and the weak interaction was massive. If a different kind of condensate field had formed, then maybe light would be massive and, and we wouldn't be here. And maybe the particles that make you up wouldn't be massive and then you wouldn't be made up. But it's even worse, well, or better. In fact, I, I, I view this as better. Because not only is our existence an accident, it's ephemeral, potentially. Because remember, these people would have invented their religious beliefs to say that this very single direction was so special, just like our mass is so special, okay? But, and the world we see is so special. But it's an accident. If they could see around, they'd see that really, there's nothing special about that. But moreover, they wouldn't know that the next morning the sun is going to rise and it's going to melt. And it's still quite possible that the Higgs field will melt. In fact, we can do some calculations and say, based on the measured mass of the Higgs, is it likely that that field's going to melt? And it turns out if it had been much lighter, it wouldn't, and much heavier, it would have. And it turns out it's right at the borderline right at the borderline of where eventually it might become unstable. Now, don't get worried. It's not, if it happens, even in the calculations where it happens, it won't happen not for 10 to the 10th years or 10 to the 10th to the, it'd be more like 10 to the 10th to the 10th years, okay? So don't sell your stocks or anything. <laughs> but I find this amazing because it means the world of our existence is not just an accident. It can go away like that. And if it does, we will. You'll be pleased to know with no advance warning because it'll happen at the speed of light. But that's the world that we find we live in. That's the intellectual journey we've taken. And what it does is it means that the universe is not just an illusion but an accident and there's no reason for our existence. It wasn't designed for our existence in any way we can see, but it may go away. And that's the beauty because it means it's so lucky that we are here and we've evolved brains that can think of this and have fun. And so instead of being disappointed by all this, you should enjoy your brief moment in the sun. Thank you very much. Oh, that was a lot. Well, thank you thank very much you. indeed, Lawrence. Thanks. Yeah, I need um, some water. Well, people are organizing their thoughts, getting their questions ready. Dizzy. So to ask you. Okay. So you were skeptical about the Higgs before it was observed. Mm -hmm. What did you think nature was going to come up with? Well, this thing? I, I mean, I, I had a bunch of theories in mind. I was ready to publish them um, when they didn't find the Higgs. And, uh, and, and in fact, I was planning to publish them just before they didn't find the Higgs, but they found it before I could publish them. Probably just as well. Um, for some people, extra publications are a good thing, but in general, I like publications that actually correspond to reality, which ha doesn't happen very often, I should say. Uh, but I thought that this Higgs field was probably some 
I mean, that the picture obviously is partly right because all the calculations of the electroweak theory work. But somehow this imaginary Higgs field, this fundamental field that froze, just seemed too simple. I thought really nature would find something more complicated that would effectively act like what we see as a Higgs field, but something that really was much more interesting than just this, this scalar field that somehow condenses. It just didn't seem like, I thought that, I mean, it's really ad hoc. Shelley Glashow, the physicist, used to call the Higgs the toilet of physics because it's where, you know, it's where all things happen you don't like to talk about. <laughs> and, 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 and it just seems very ad hoc, and it still does, in a sense. We don't know why this single scalar field would work. So I was really shocked. And, and, um, but the other thing that came, which is people don't appreciate, and even many of my colleagues, I've found this many times in my life when I've written papers after the fact, Theorists like to think about things, but, no, but you tend not to take things seriously until the experiment's actually performed. And it's true, I predicted dark matter, but I, didn't, I mean dark energy, but I didn't, I didn't believe it um, until they had discovered it. But more importantly, there are many papers I've written about things that I could have written a long time before, but it was only when the experiment was performed that I said, oh, really, this is... And so after the Higgs was discovered, I, 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 I've written papers, of one of which suggests there may be a relationship between the Higgs and dark energy. It's, it's no doubt wrong. Uh, it's ugly. But it's amazing that it's even possible. And I would never have thought of that. So, so we, physicists need, theorists need to be guided by experiment. And not just because it tells us how nature really works, but it often provokes our minds. And that's why, even things, that's why things like string theory, which are incredibly inventive and creative, are probably, in my mind, not inventive or creative enough. Because it's the, the imagination of nature is so much greater than that of human beings. And we need to look outward. And um, I'm giving you a long answer, but I'll give it anyway. Uh, as I've often say, and, and, and I think this is of vital importance, uh, and some people might disagree, but nothing important about the universe is ever discovered by revelation. Every time people have revelations it, based on internal examinations and not thinking about the outside world at all, it's wrong, I would argue. <laughs> okay. You, you mentioned there that uh, uh, as a result of the discoveries of the Large Hadron Collider, mm. you're starting to think a little bit about whether they might give us some clue about dark energy and dark matter? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I don't know, it, it, I'll tell you a joke anyway, because Richard's been on this hall telling this joke. Have you, you have his, if you've ever read Richard Dawkins' book, one of his, one of his books, which, which, is, which he actually talked about the Large Hadron Collider, but it, there was a misspell. It's called Large Hard-On Collider. Which I thought was <laughs> Physicists get a hard-on about it. But anyway, um, but uh, the, the, uh, the, it, the, we, many of us thought that associated with the reason the, the, the Higgs is the way it is, there's a new symmetry of nature called supersymmetry. And what's really interesting is it predicts a whole bunch of new particles. Now, why do we care about that? I mean, it's a whole bunch of new particles we haven't seen, so you could say... The theory's wrong, but it turns out for every particle in nature, there's a partner called a supersymmetric particle. And so we can say we've discovered half the particles in nature. So it's half full rather than half empty. But the neat thing is, the lightest of these will remain stable and almost invisible. And it'll have exactly the properties we need for dark matter. In fact, you can calculate from these theories how much of the stuff should be left over from the early universe, and you get enough to be just the right amount of dark matter. It all looks so perfect that most of us thought the first thing the Large Hadron Collider would see would be dark matter, the particles that make up dark matter, the supersymmetric particles. The Higgs was much harder to discover. In fact, it wasn't even guaranteed to discover it. We, we thought it might, we might need another machine, and we haven't discovered those other particles. Mm -hmm. Now, the energy of the Large Hadron Collider has been turned up, the intensity has been turned up, and so they're hopeful, but it is of some concern to us because uh, if that theory is, is wrong, then, um, then it means we, we were back at the drawing boards. Mm -hmm. While that's of some concern, it's also exciting. Because, uh, again, I think I've said on this stage before that, that, that for if you're a theorist, the best state to be in is, or two states to be in are either wrong or confused. Because that means there's more to learn. And I'm usually wrong and confused. So, but, uh, so we'll see. Uh, we just don't know. And it'll be... It, it, there were two nightmare scenarios of, of the people who built the Large Hadron Collider. One is that it would see nothing which is what I was betting on at the time. But the other is it would just see the Higgs and nothing else, because it doesn't tell us what direction is right. And moreover, if it just sees the Higgs and nothing else, sociologically, it may mean that, that there won't be any, any motivation of governments to say, yeah, we, we want to find the answer, and we may not be... Because the next collider certainly has to be international, multinational, and, one, and, and frankly, it's really relevant at the current times, because what we're seeing 
in the United States and in England and in other countries is this ridiculous nationalism, this ugly head of nationalism rearing its head. And whether that ends international collaborations is, is, is an open question. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, asking to Jinder Verdi, who was on the CMS experiment mm -hmm. back in 2012, I said to him, it must have been an absolutely fantastic feeling on the day you felt ready to publish. We've seen the Higgs, we've yeah. verified it, it's, it's great. And he said, yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. But you know what? It would have been even better if we hadn't seen it. Because yeah, then there would be so much more physics. To yeah, be. well, I mean, the <laughs> whole, I mean, everything, that standard model would have been wrong in a fundamental way. And that's really much more exciting, in a sense, because, um, you know, it, it, the search is always more exciting than the finding, I think. And, and the fact that there's more to learn is, is, is what keeps us going. And, and in fact, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's important in stories like this. That's why it's called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. Because the best part of the story is yet to be told. And people don't realize that. They think that it was all done by sort of dead white men 100 years ago. And it's not. And, 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 and there's, t there's incredible things to be discovered by the young people, if there are any in this audience, and, and, and in the future. The best, 100 years from now, the best parts of the story will be the part that I haven't told. Well, the audience is very dark, actually. Can we change the lights? It a little would bit? be can wonderful. We have the house I, I lights the up and put the spots off so we can see who's going to ask questions. I don't know if they're filming, but it but doesn't yeah. matter for me. Okay. Okay. Because I can okay. already see there's a, an arm one. up over there near yeah. the back. Yeah, near you in the and near are, back. Are there uh, microphones as well? Ah, they're bringing them over to him. Yeah. Yeah. Turn the audience lights up and. Yes. Yeah. Well, where does that? Uh-oh, the microphone doesn't work. Okay, try it again. There we go. Oh, it's working. Where does that put the holographic universe, if there's such a thing? Okay, the question was about the holographic universe. One of the interesting aspects of string theory is it suggests that the fact that we are in this four-dimensional universe that we didn't know is just the tip of a really big iceberg in the sense that string theory requires there to be many more dimensions in general. String theory has required many different things over the years, none of which have been tested, um, and none of which have really unfortunately allowed us to make predictions. But it used to predict 26 dimensions uh, due to an infinity problem, and then, and then it went down to 11 dimensions and then a little bit less. And then the interesting thing that was recognized, and this is fascinating mathematically, is that it's possible that dimensions themselves don't mean anything that one person's five-dimensional universe could be another person's four-dimensional universe. And it's like a hologram. In the sense, a picture is a two-dimensional representation of this room. Okay? But a hologram is a three-dimensional representation of the room. Namely, if I have a hologram picture of this room and I move over there, I can see some of you behind the person in front. That's what's neat about a hologram. It stores all the information of a three-dimensional image in a two-dimensional object. So in some sense, a hologram is a two-dimensional representation that contains all the information of a three-dimensional object. And some people have argued that it's possible that we're living in a hologram of sorts, that, 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 we, that, that, we're, a that we're a sort of four-dimensional projection of an underlying five or six or seven-dimensional universe. It's very interesting mathematics. There's no evidence that it's true. It does allow for some interesting mathematical connections to be made, which have been useful but not but useful in describing other physical systems than the whole universe. So it's a fascinating idea, and it's, one, it's part of the never-ending realization that what was called string theory is not, it is, was not understood at all. In fact, strings may not even be important. And that it's really a whole new developing area of mathematics that may, may one day pay off. But right now we have no idea what even the fundamental objects or the, the physics associated with these things are. And, and as I say, one of the Surprising realizations is that, is that maybe even this, what we mean by dimensions is an illusion, that we are living in a hologram. It's a very sexy idea, and that's why it's got a lot of play. But right now, there's no evidence of it whatsoever in the real world. I mean, as I say, there are small physical systems where you can mathematically solve them by solving them in another series of dimensions. So the mathematics that's been developed has been very useful in different areas of physics. But it, for describing fundamental reality, it's not yet ready for prime time. Anybody else? You've got a question in the front here? Yeah. You've got to have the mic. Mic's in the way. front. Right in the front row. Uh, 
Um, we were told years ago that the speed of light was as fast as speed there was. There is. Uh, is um, which seems to be quite wrong now, of course, because um, if you have two objects travelling towards one another at, let's say, three quarters of the speed of light, their closing speed is obviously going to be... You'd think so, wouldn't you? Yeah. And but it, it, it's, it's not the way it works. Well... I, I'd like no, to that's what, no, the, the mathematics, it's, special relativity is full of these catch-22s, where if you, two yeah. objects can be traveling towards each other at 99% the speed of light, and each of them will see each other, and the light is traveling, everything traveling less than the speed of light. But, I want to, I want to be on your side here for a second, especially before you start arguing with me. Um, <laughs> that is, that we lied to you when we told you things can't travel faster than the speed of light. You have to be like a lawyer and parse a little more carefully. Nothing can travel through space faster than light. But it turns out space can do whatever the hell it wants. And in fact, in our universe now, there are objects receding from us faster than light. They're not moving. In fact, they're at rest just like we are. We're at rest in our local surroundings. They're at rest in their local surroundings. But the space between us is expanding faster than light. So they're receding faster than light, and in fact, we'll never see them. So locally, they're standing still. That's what's great about general relativity. You can be moving at the speed of light and be standing still at the same time. And that's confusing, right? Well, yeah, I still, I still don't understand that the collision wouldn't occur at... Uh, well, I mean, it's the mathematics of... The point is that each person... It's, it's a conspiracy speed. of measuring space and time. The conspiracy is such that each person measures the speed of the other object because of their distorted, separately distorted versions of space and time. So they think, see, see things coming at them at less than speed c. Another example of that is one that I, I didn't mention, but I said I made, allude, I made allude to, and I think it's even more paradoxical. Remember I told you for observers, some people will find some things happen before the others. One observer will find this event happens before that event, and the other observer will say that event happened before that event. What about cause and effect, the kind of things that philosophers worry about? If one event, the only way you can be the cause of an, uh, an effect is if you happen before it. So if it switches, then there goes out cause and effect, except for this catch-22 of uh, special relativity. It turns out that the time difference between before and after that happened for different distant objects is always less than the time it like, takes light to travel between them. And since no information can travel faster than light, one object can never be the cause of the other object. And so it all works out. It's just, it's just this cosmic conspiracy to, that nature has to, to end up being sensible but but at the same time, illogical. And, and that's really important. Another, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think of lessons that can be learned beyond your own confusion. And that is, or, and it's nothing wrong, it is very confusing. Uh, and that is that common sense is not a guide to the universe. And that's really an important thing. Com we've learned that, you know, common sense is something we evolved with. And we evolved with it because it was useful to us at human scales. And Richard has said, you know, it, it's useful because we learned how to run away from lions on the savannah, not to understand quantum mechanics. And so it's, common sense is a good guide for certain things, but we shouldn't use it when we explore the unknown. Same with anthropology, same for civilization, same for, same for many things, same for different groups. For some people, it's common sense to be attracted to a person of an opposite sex. But it's not universal. Get over it. Okay, anyway. Look, the question, uh, the question, uh, the question is wearing an England rugby jersey, so the hope that something can travel faster than the speed of light is obviously wishful thinking on your part. No, in fact, let me tell you something. There was a while an experiment discovered, you may have heard this, at the, at, again, at the Large Hadron Collider, there were, it, it looked like there was a beam that went to Italy, and, and it appeared to be arrived faster than light, and it caused, there were headlines around the world. I immediately said it was wrong for a few reasons. One, theoretically, was crazy, but more importantly, so it arrived something like 100 milliseconds faster than the speed of light in, in Italy. And I pointed out that nothing ever arrives early in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Question over there. Yeah. Uh, hello, Professor Krauss. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, that was a really uh, great uh, talk, and Thank one you. day I'm going to understand it. Um, the great thing is, you know, the great thing is, there's a book you can get. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. All right. um, 
Now, the thing that keeps me up at night is, um, perhaps you can comment on it, is apparently there are now two trillion universes in the galaxy. Two trillion galaxies in our universe. Sorry, two trillion ga uh, galaxies in the universe, yes. So it's kind of gone up a hell of a lot from probably 400 billion before. Yeah, what, what was in my book. Uh, now yeah. I'm going to tell you something really neat, right. which isn't in the newspapers. Okay. There are two trillion and 400 billion at the same time. <laughs> Not at the same time. But now I knew, I, so you thought it was going to be easy. Okay, but here is really neat. This is a clear example of the fact that when we look out at the universe, we're seeing a slice in space and time. So the statement is, there are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe, and that's true. Because what's happened is, astronomers have been able to look at far greater distances to see fainter galaxies, and they measure a lot of small galaxies, a lot more small galaxies, small faint galaxies than we thought existed. But what happened? Those small faint galaxies combined together, collided together over time to form the galaxies that exist today. Our Milky Way galaxy is still cannibalizing other small galaxies. So if you look out at the universe, you see two trillion galaxies. But that's because you're looking back in time. If you ask how many galaxies exist today, it's more like 400 billion. Because all those galaxies, many of those galaxies combined together to form galaxies. But when we look out at the universe, we're not seeing it at a single time. We're seeing it as spread out in time. So we see two trillion, but really today, most of those two trillion have combined together to form 20 times fewer galaxies. So, it's, so there you go. So we were right and wrong at the same time, which is always nice. Question down here in the front, on the left. That was a really good question, though. Yeah. And yours was too. I don't Keep mean to <laughs> What are your thoughts on the EM drive or the M drive produced by... Yeah, Jackson? someone asks, people ask about this all the time. This is using the vacuum to, 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 to somehow get energy. And NASA's talked about this. And as I was saying to someone else uh, the other day, um, NASA doesn't know what's asked from a hole in the ground when it comes to fundamental physics. I mean, really. It embarrasses me and offends me. Because NASA's great at engineering and, and, and making rockets. And that's what it should be doing. But... Um, the point is, you can't mine the vacuum and get energy. Now, it is true that empty space has energy. That was one of the things I proposed and was discovered. Empty space has energy. So why not use it? Well, the answer is, we think, okay, that this empty, the energy of empty space is what we call the ground state energy, the energy of the vacuum. Now, what does that mean? The vacuum in physics is the lowest energy state. Okay? the lowest energy state. So, so for at least on this table, the lowest energy state is for this, this picture to be on the table. Okay? It's got more energy when I put it. And I can get energy out of it by letting it go, but I'm not going to do it. Okay? Now, so the vacuum, we think, we, we, the vacuum is defined to be the lowest energy state in nature. Now, it has non-zero energy. But if you could extract energy from it, there'd be another state that's lower energy. You cannot mine the vacuum. It's just... It's just simple as that. And, and, and NASA has explored that, and I, I've been to NASA. You know, I wrote a book on the physics of Star Trek, and, and there they was a group there that wanted to build a warp drive. And I remember going into the meeting, and there were all these models of the USS Enterprise <laughs> there, and all these engineers were really excited. And the point is, it's true, I wrote, you know, warp drive might be possible in principle, but, but we don't know, given the laws of physics, but it might be possible. But it's not an engineering problem. It's not something where you're going to tinker and, you know, and somehow, suddenly, it's fundamental physics. And, and, and so, um, you know, there are new ways of, of going faster than we can go, and NASA's looking at some of them. I'm involved in one. It's called Breakthrough Starshot. So my friend Stephen Hawking is on the same committee. And we, and it, it, we met, we're talking about developing a device that will travel at 20% the speed of light to get to Alpha Centauri in 20 years. That may be possible. Maybe. It's on the edge. Okay. But, so there are lots of interesting ideas you can do, but mining the vacuum for energy, if anyone talks to you about that, uh, don't listen. If anyone asks you to invest in it, don't invest. <laughs> Question there? Come to you in a minute. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is this. So your theory is before um, the Higgs field. Yeah. Is there an experiment you can run now to still prove them? Uh, to still prove my, my ideas are right? Yeah. 
Well, I haven't given up. Um, and in fact, but, but I'm in the process of actually write, working on a paper to see if there's, if, if there's any way that the Higgs could be an illusion. And I'm still, you know, I think it's worth exploring. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the more we explore, the more difficult it is, but I haven't given up yet. Um, and it's important not to give up. Uh, but it's also, I'll be happy to be wrong, and, uh, and I'll be happier to be right, because this time, maybe the Nobel Committee will do the right thing. Um, <laughs> and, and, no, anyway, it doesn't even matter. Uh, but but, but the, you got the point. It has to make a prediction that somehow, if, it, if, it, if, it, if it's exactly the same as what we see, then it's kind of a useless theory, right? It has to be able to predict something different, some new observation that's different. Because if you can't falsify it, it really isn't good science. So I could maybe make a theory that reproduces everything we can see that somehow is, you know, wheels within wheels, you know. But if it doesn't predict something else you can see, then, it's, then the simplest theory is just as good. And, and so uh, you really have to look for something new. And, and that's what we've been looking at. But uh, uh, the likelihood is most theories are wrong. Almost all theories are wrong. And, and by wrong, I mean that they don't agree with nature. And, and if it wasn't that way, any, anyone could do it. And, um, and, and I'm, 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 I've created beautiful theories in my life. And nature just hasn't been smart enough to adopt them, that's all. <laughs> uh, by the way, I really like the attitude of, of uh, working at uh, overturning the Higgs findings, because it gives us hope on Trump and Brexit. You know? <laughs> Is somebody and, I don't know which will be easier. <laughs> Uh, it, about, yeah, have you got a mic? Trump yet? hasn't been elected yet. I keep reminding people. Just remember, well, we haven't that. left the EU Five yet, days <laughs> for now. So there's still time. Anyway, yes. So um, when you spoke briefly about uh, infinity, you said. Could you that, stand up so yeah. uh, Lawrence could see you and I can maybe hear you better? Yeah. yeah. So when you um, spoke about infinity, you said it was a bit crazy and physicists didn't really like it. So my question is is the universe itself infinite? Is it the universe infinite? Oh, good question. We don't like infinities. Um, and the answer is we don't know if the universe is infinite. Um, the best picture is, I think, based on what we, uh, our current ideas, which are tentative, and I wrote about in the last book, is that it's not. It's just very, very, very big. I think, what's his name, said that in, in, the, in, the, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's so big it makes going to the chemist look like nothing. But, but, uh, um, but it's very big but finite. Okay, so that gets, but it turns out you don't get, you, so that solves that problem, but it does, it comes at a cost. Our universe may be finite, but there's a possibility that there are an infinite number of universes. And if there are, things are very, very strange, because then those weird things that infinity makes possible are suddenly possible. Because if there are an infinite number of universes, then, then everything is repeated, and, or not repeated, but if there are an infinite number of universes, then this lecture is happening, will happen, exactly the same, except a few words will be different, in another universe. But not just once, an infinite number of times. And then there'll be an infinite number of universes in which I'm sitting there and you're up here. And, and, and so it's really disgusting. <laughs> and, 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 and not that you're up here, I'd be happy, but no, well, I'd prefer if you have it here, I guess. But... but um, but so it, th these are problems that physicists are actually dealing with. Because if there are an infinite number of universes, then probabilistically arguments tend to go out the window. But the good news is it's most likely that our, our universe is finite if that makes, and that's at least easier for many of us to comprehend. But the universe doesn't really care what we like. And so we'll just have to find out. And there may be ways of testing, as, as, I, as I have talked about in another lecture recently, we may actually be able to test for the existence of other universes, which I didn't think was possible four years ago when I wrote Universe from Nothing. So there's great progress that we may have been be able, in the midst of making. It has to do with gravitational waves. Uh, I spotted you two guys. Um, it was going to be you with galaxies on your tie, but somebody's got the mic before you, so we'll come to you second. Uh, okay, Final we'll come wish. next. Okay, we'll do that, and then I guess you. Yes. Hi. So what are your thoughts on uh, quantum entanglement, and can it be used for transferring information faster than speed of light. Ah, good. And by the way, it's the DNA. I don't think it's galaxies. But it's anyway, DNA, but anyway it? um, <laughs> so, okay, it looks, like, it looks like quantum mechanics allows information to be tra transferred faster than light. Once again, a cosmic catch-22. It can't be. So it is true, and this, po this bothered Einstein, one of the many reasons he didn't buy quant quantum mechanics, because of this spooky action at a distance, as he called it. Um, 
it is true that I can do what's called entanglement. I can entangle two particles, like two electrons or two photons, create them in a very special quantum mechanical state, and then I can separate them from here to Alpha Centauri. And then, let's say I take two electrons and I create, say, create them in a state so one is spin up and one is spin down. Actually, they have opposite spins. It turns out they're spinning in all directions at the same time, okay? But they're opposite, whatever. At the same time, they're spinning in all directions, but they have opposite directions. And I move them here. Now, I measure this one, and I find out it's spinning over here. It immediately makes this one spin that way, or at least that one will be measured to be spinning that way. Immediately. So, isn't that information traveling faster than light? I mean, it's not... It's instantaneous. I do this measurement here. Instantaneously, that other one collapses into that state. Before I made the measurement, they were both spinning in all directions at the same time. I measure this one, suddenly, boom, I find it's that direction. That makes this one go in that direction. Well, it sounds like information faster than light, but it turns out it's not. And no information is transferred in that. Okay. So how can you, how can you do this? Well, so if I have an experimenter here, and he measures it here, an experimenter here will, be, will measure that electron to be that way, okay? But let's take 100 electrons, okay? So if I measure 100 electrons, 50% of the time I'll find this one electron to be spinning that way, and 50% of the time I'll find it spinning that way, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, okay? What will this experimenter measure? 50% of the time it'll be pointing down, 50% of the time it'll be pointing up. There's no experiment that this ex experimenter can do that will tell him that this measurement's been made. The only way to know is if this experimenter phones that experimenter and then says, the next electron you measure will be spinning down. And that's true, but that happens at the speed of light. So no information is transferred faster than light, even though, so, you know, the universe is just, you know, the way it is, and it's, you know, okay. Gentleman there. Hi. Um, the question from the front row reminded me of something. Oh, we, oh yeah, we're, yeah, we're going there and there. We did promise him after that. Okay, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could, could you um, tell me what you think of, of uh, the uh, alternatives to uh, inflationary theories, theories like... Um, High speed of light in the early universe. Oh yeah, okay. Inflation what, is what sort of uh, what is the problem that these these models are trying to uh, uh, solve? Well, people have d look, inflation is an idea w which which I could have talked about in a longer lecture here, and I certainly have in the la last book. Um, it, it's the it turns out we have every reason to believe that that there was a really big energy in empty space early on in the history of the universe, and when the universe was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old, it expanded very fast, increasing its volume by a factor of 10 to the 90th in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second, going from the size of an atom to the size of a soccer ball in an instant. And it turns out we, all, our ideas of particle physics tell us that that's plausible, but more importantly, it actually resolves all the problems of our physical u visible universe. It really explains why the universe looks the way it does. So we think it's plausible. You might say, if it explains what the universe, why the universe is the way it is, then we've tested it and we know what happened. But that's not true, because while inflation explains everything we see, it turns out the idea of inflation is so malleable that if everything we see was different, inflation could explain that too. And as I said before, that's not a good physical theory. So inflation is an idea right now. It's the best idea we have. But of course, people are saying, well, it's just an idea. Maybe there are other alternatives. Some of those alternatives are stranger than others. One that's not so strange is that maybe the speed of light changes, and that explains our property. It turns out it's a really, it's a really silly idea. It, it, I mean, in a sense, not silly, I shouldn't say that, but, it, but first of all, we know, well, it's silly because experimentally we can actually test back to when the universe was far less than a second old that the speed of light hasn't changed, okay? So somehow it would only have to change very early on and then stop changing. We can measure to an accuracy of better than one part in 100,000 that the speed of light was the same in the early universe that it is now. It's amazing you can do that, but we can do that. But more importantly, there's no theoretical reason why the speed of light should change, because it really would mean the fundamental laws of electromagnetism would have to change, because they're based, the speed of light is based on those. And it's much more radical a predict, an assumption than inflation, because inflation happens naturally, given essentially the laws of physics we now understand. And so you have to it's far more radical than inflation. In fact, as my friend Frank Wilczek would say, inflation is radically conservative in the sense that it's pretty well the simplest idea that explains everything we see. 
And these other ideas are much more Baroque. Does that mean they're wrong? No, but they're much less well-motivated, okay? And, and they're unnecessary at this point because the physics that we know of, with very little modification, can explain everything we see. So there isn't really the need for those modifications. Again, that doesn't mean they're not there, but it just means that, that if you're a betting person, you, you'd say that they're not necessary and they're probably not there then. But, you know, we'll the only way is to find out. Yes? I want to ask you, is time real? Or what? is it, is time real? Or is it just a concept? I think it's real because we're going to end in a few minutes. <laughs> and, and if I look at that clock, and, and it certainly is real in the sense that, that um, you feel differently now than you did an hour and a half ago. And, and better or worse, I can't say. So, so it's, you know, I, I, time is real, but, but, what, but the point is that you, people don't ask, is space real? And time and space are tied together by relativity, and generally, even more so by general relativity. So, so time, in some sense, is as real as space. Now, it is true that perceptions of space and perceptions of time are, are relative. So in that sense, neither is real, but there is some, but, 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 but they, are the, they are the playing field on which things happen. Space and time are the playing field on which events occur. And, and if that playing field didn't exist, the events wouldn't occur. The characteristics of the events depend upon the nature of the playing field. As I often say, if a, if a cricket stadium were ten times bigger, it'd be, it'd be Ten times more boring, and 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 if such a thing is possible, um, and and so uh, so they they are the parameters that we use to describe the universe. They do they have so I don't know what 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 when people talk about reality, uh, I don't really know what that means in the sense that that um, space clearly exists. To, uh, we measure it to exist. Time clearly exists. We measure it to exist. My watch ticks, and so. So, but it is true that those are facets of, of our accident of our existence, just like the Higgs field. But I don't think that doesn't make them real. It just means that, that we have a myopic view. That it, that, so our experience of time may be, may be, our experience of time through our consciousness may be myopic and artificial. And that may be true, but that's, that's outside my pay grade. I mean, seriously, because when you start talking about consciousness, you're talking about stuff that nobody understands, no matter all those books. Someone once said there's so many books on consciousness because no one understands it. You only need one book on gravity. Okay. And so, um, so it's, you know, maybe we'll find that out. But those are, those are questions that, that I don't think are, that, that really aren't essential for physicists to worry about because we use the concepts of space and time to make predictions that work. So, so I can make a prediction about time that if I take a gun and shoot you, that something will happen in the future. And, 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 and that prediction will be accurate. And that's all that science... Science doesn't try to do anything more than that. This is going to be have, have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Have you got the mic? Okay. This gentleman here. Stick your hand up so we can see where to bring the mic. Thanks. Uh, interesting stuff. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Obviously, the, as you alluded to, there's a lot of people who don't quite get it. Probably me included. Oh, well, all, none of us yeah. quite get it. That's what's so fun. Yeah. And a lot of people need education. What can we do to educate people? What we do, what? And a lot of people need education there. Yeah. Oh, what do we do to educate people? Yeah. Well, I wish I had a silver bullet. I mean, I try. I think what we need to do is first excite people. And one of the ways we don't do that, as I say, is we teach physics as if it's done by dead white men 100 years ago or 200 years ago. There are many outstanding problems to be solved. And you can understand those outstanding problems without knowing everything. I mean, you can understand, you can understand what the problems are. And, and, I, and I, 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 I was using a quote, from, which is in one of my books, which is from Louise Bogan, which says something like, the, the greatest part of any, any, any mystery is the starting point. And so we can bring people to the starting point so they get excited. But we do that, it seems to me, in a way that's the opposite of the way we educate people, which is we, because of the accident of history, we, think, we tend to take, treat schools as sources of information, as sources of answers. What they really should be is sources of questions. You don't, if you, if, you know, you have one of these, you can get a lot of information and misinformation. What we need to do 
is, is encourage kids to ask questions. And then work with them and be willing to say, I don't know the answer. Parents need to do this. Teachers need to do this. To say, I don't know the answer, but let's see if we can find out the answer. So it's a voyage of discovery. It's not, it's not ramming things down people's heads because that's boring for everyone. It, and so what we need to do is educate, especially now, is educate children to question, but also, equally important, to, to learn how to proceed to a logical way to, to try and get answers. And Anthony's nodding because he'd say that's what philosophy is in some sense. And he's right. Uh, but the, the, the point is that we particularly need to teach kids how to filter information because there's lots of stuff here and you need to know how to tell the wheat from the chaff. And the, that process is a scientific process, the skeptical process, scientific skepticism, not accepting things on faith, questioning and demanding evidence. So the process of questioning and the process of learning how to the answer that's what we need to teach in school, and the rest will come, because uh, most of what you learn in life you don't learn in school, and so it's not as if it's not as if you're going to get all the answers. So that's my little prescription, and I wish, you know. Anyway, that's my prescription. Well, I'm 100 percent with uh, Lawrence on that one. You you may know if you've done your homework on Lawrence that he's the foundation professor at the University of Arizona, heads up the uh, an institute called the Origins Institute, has a very very modest remit. They're just investigating the origins of the universe and life, so that's... Uh, yeah. And everything. Uh, life, the universe, and everything. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, after the election uh, in the States, uh, in fact, the very next day, I got a message from Lawrence asking for a job over here, but I was busy, <laughs> I, I, I was busy packing to leave because of Brexit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were going to switch. <laughs> <laughs> so so all, all I can say is that it, it, um, I'm pretty sure Lawrence is not going to feel that much at home in the US in the next few years if... Uh, if the Electoral College doesn't do what he wants it to do. But at least he's at home in the universe. And thank you very much indeed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you really good, really good. Thanks, everybody. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.